Hi, I'm Tracy Swedlow, and this is Television Nation. I am very happy and always excited to talk to the articulate, the smart, insightful, ahead of her time, Randa Minkara, who's the co-founder and CEO of a new company. It's not so new. New branded, newly branded company called Resonance AI. Welcome to the show, Randa. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy, for having me. Of course, uh, the company, which is now rebranded, was Transform Digital. So tell us a little bit about why you have rebranded, and then we're going to talk about what the company does and um, what's new and the industry at large. Sounds good. We rebranded after a few years of building and developing our platform when we realized that what we talk about all the time is resonance. How does content resonate with audiences? And th th those are two of the elements that go into the platform. We spent a lot of time explaining what Transform was. And we realized that since we talk about resonance, called our platform, the Resonance AI platform, that we should call ourselves that as well. It cuts down on a great deal of explanation. It makes it very, very clear that we are in the AI world and what we are doing. So we thought that it was best to rebrand and spend more time talking about outcomes and what we can do to help our customers as opposed to who we are. Um, I forgot actually, because um, we spoke about it before, but um, you're in your home. Where are you Where are you located right now? I'm located in Seattle and the company headquarters is in Seattle. All right, right. Uh, it's busy in Seattle right now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We'll be okay over there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit um, about uh, what the company is doing. Um, you've got this beautiful site. Shall we show them? Oh, please, yes. Okay. Yes, as part of the rebrand, we uh, redid our website uh, to, to focus more clearly on who we serve and what precisely we do. So I'll let this run a bit, but network studios, broadcasters, streamers, you know, content creators, UGC, all through, you want to know as, as a content owner creator, what, how does it resonate with my audience? What are the elements inside of my, my content that are actually resonating, right? We do say that not all video is created equal. We know that intuitively, but we can use AI now to really help you understand what is, are the right elements? What should I keep? What should I do more of? What should I do less of? And what we have done, our platform analyzes video with human-like perception. Why is that important? It's important because what we're extracting from the video is what we call a higher concept. Some of that is the dialogue itself, the pace, the emotions, what is happening on that screen really? What are the things that the audience is resonating with? It's not that there's a person standing there talking to another person and a wall behind that person with a palm tree. That's not what's happening. What we are looking at is how that video is playing. What are those elements? Music and dialogue are critical. The characters themselves, who is in the video, what is the interaction between those characters, what is the story? Once we have all of that determined, all the style and the elements, we then are able to tie that to performance. And performance is what we call audience intelligence. And audience intelligence is the analysis of your downloads. How many shows did they binge? Did they start? Did they stop? Did they watch three episodes uh, all told from that device? Or we use linear ratings. Whatever your measure of success is, your measure of performance, that's what we're doing on a second-by-second -second basis. So we work with a variety of partners. One of our favorite partners is TiVo. Uh, we... Uh, love their data. It is data that's available to customers that license it on a, on a second by second basis. If you are a streamer, we're obviously using your, your data directly from, from your, your player. Um, so there are a variety of different ways we can approach it. We have a partnership with Comscore for those that are looking for a linear rating comparison. Uh, 30 by 30 on the national level. Mm -hmm. We really do not want to work with granularity less than a 30 by 30. It is very difficult to understand what is happening inside the content. But you don't create, um, you know, uh, 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 oh, I've forgotten the name of that. You don't create like a, a panel uh, yourself. You don't go into the field yourself to pull all this no. up. Okay. No, we are, we are, 
what we do is really look at that audio in an audio and video together. So one of the things we do that's a differentiator from, let's say, the Googles out there that have great platforms, but our platform is built by media for media. It's only applicable to media. And we look not just at the video, but we also analyze the, content, the audio itself so that we can understand the context. There, it's, you cannot look at just the object, the video, the, the static video, without understanding what's going on in the background. You know, are there, is there somebody yelling? Is there somebody yelling over that person's shoulder? Is there, uh, you know, a thunderclap in the background? That sort of thing really, really helps you derive context and helps you string together what is happening in the shots so that you do have the higher elements that come out of it, the complexity, the moods, uh, the interaction between the characters. And how do you, how do you segment out all of these objects or moments or situations? How do you break apart the fabric of the video? So we have developed what we call our code books, and those code books are, de are defining how we're looking at it. So if it's a newscast, there's a newscast code book. If it's a movie, if it's a series, there are a whole different number of ways we can look at that, but it's very, very specific. So the AI knows that if it's looking at a newscast, what it is looking for is the start time, the end time, who read it, what location, um, what was the subject matter, that, that sort of thing. And so the AI is trained specifically to look for elements inside that video. And so you don't that, have to have somebody sitting there at, at the video sort of identifying different objects in, that they see? No, we do not have somebody doing that. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, in the old, on the old days, in the old AI, day, AI days, uh, that's that's what they would have teams of people who would sort of create the metadata of the video fabric. Right. So what we've done is replace that right. the platform that okay. does that. Now, yes. I will share that we do have a little bit of human in the loop uh, when we're first training video on a new set, right? So if you if it, if it's a new algorithm or a new model, we're go there's going to be training sessions. There will be people looking at that to to you know know that the the outcome is is exactly what the model is saying. So and there's a little human in the loop. Let's say we have. Um, a new uh, a movie we've run through, it will automatically pull up all of the characters inside of that movie from databases. So we have that already inside of it. Mm -hmm. It will at, at occasion ask, you know, say there are five instances here, we would like a human verification. But that takes a couple seconds. And then once done, it's permanently done. And some of the um, advances that we've created are once our AI identifies a character, if that character walks from the front of the screen to the back of the screen and is now mixed in with 20 extras, we still know it's that character. That's amazing. It is. It's pretty cool. And if that person puts on a hat or a mask, still, we know who that person is. We I mean, can identify them from the back of their head, from the side of their head, as well as from just looking straight it, on. How does it do that? If, if, if facial tracking, something else, the shape of the body? I mean, like, I have no idea. How it's all data points. And, and, you know, thank goodness for, for technology where it is today. When you think about that, it's a massive, massive amount of data that's collected. And then from that, we don't turn back that kind of data to people. Obviously, you can't use that. But what you can use is, well, the lighting changed dramatically in episode three and four. The storytelling went, the complexity went way down. And the mood was extremely somber throughout, and you saw the audience drift away. However, when you get to episode six, you see episode six through, let's say, ten, you see growth through the, through the rest of the season. So we can, we can look at the elements that were different in those actual episodes and explain potentially a better way to tell the story next time. Are you saying that happy stories keep people hooked <laughs> more? Well, <laughs> emotion is really important. And we did, we did do some analysis on a series that was, we looked at season one and season two. And the question was, why did season two fail? Now, as media people, we all know intuitively why we thought it failed, right? I mean, we can look at it and say, well, I hated this and I hated that and this wasn't good. 
but we were able to run it through and come back to them and say very specifically in season two, the audience did not like the, the one of your actors at all. The story complexity doubled and it was very difficult for the audience if, if they missed anything to pick it up and continue. The, the mood and emotion was so dark. It was depressing. And after six depressing episodes, most people just gave up. And it's interesting because I know you also analyze news. And news, yeah. of course, feeds on fear, right? Let's be honest. It was only John Krasinski's, you know, some good news, whatever it was called. It was very popular, but short-lived. We'll see what happens with what they do with it. But the, the establishment media industry is trying to inform you, but they're always scaring you at the same time. And they're very successful at it. It must be different in the news business, therefore, how emotion. Do you analyze that? I'm just curious about news versus regular content but and how your technology um, analyzes that. We do look at it very differently, but we do we do look at emotion. And we do look to see, is the audience, inter you know, did they stay for joy and happiness? You would be surprised how much they do. Um, we like the, at the end of the show, at the end of the show, they give you that good hook where they're going to tell you some piece of good news at the end of the, at the broadcast, right? Yeah. That's their tease. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what we do for news is a little bit different in that we analyze things like how strong is your open? Did you keep them through the show? Right. How long did you keep your audience through the show? If they went away, why did they go? What seg what segment turned them off? We're able to really help understand which locations are interesting versus ones that are really a turn off to the audience. And rather than doing what you've done before, if you have some data that shows you, you know what, in front of the courthouse in this particular market isn't resonating at all, um, we can tell you that. We can tell you when a subject begins to peak in, in interest for people. Um, we can look at the competitive newscasts in the marketplace and say, wow, this, this station's open was much stronger than your station's open, and they, and, you, and they kept it. And you can analyze it in real time, or you know, not real time, really, I should say the next day or later in the day. Um, real time, you're actually doing your newscast, so you don't care about that. But what many stations have is a war room. They've got all the other competing news is on that at the same time they're on it, let's say at six o'clock. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're looking at that as it's happening. Well, what we allow is you can do some very deep analysis after that when you're not in the crunch of putting your newscast on, right? You, you are actually um, able to do some very good analysis and, and, and comparisons and understand finally what resonates. And for me, that's really, really important. I wanted to know if, I, if I'm a news director in a marketplace and I know what kind of human interest works in this market, I can run that. If I know for sure that, that um, a certain type of adversity, you know, a humans overcoming adversary, adversity runs, then when that story presents itself to me, I know I can run that and I'll know where to put it in my show for the better, best effect and make my audience happy. I think that a lot of, you know, we're not trying to write news for people, but certainly, if you understand what works, you're more free to serve your community better. And to do that with data means it's really kind of hard to argue. Is the customer able to compare their results with uh, other results? Do you bring in um, other shows that they can look at? Or, or you're just watching their own content against their own audience? No, we can bring in other shows that they are interested in. Now, you know, we, we need permission, obviously, to do that. Um, you know, there is, we don't, we don't uh, keep video. We don't, you know, if somebody gives us a video to analyze, we do that. We keep the meta. We don't keep the show itself. We don't own the content. And are you picking up any other third-party data like um, social media and things like that? I don't think you're doing that necessarily. Or are uh, you? We can do that. We can do that, yes. And we have done it. It just depends on what the customer wants. I think there's a couple of different approaches that we have. One is a customer who wants just deep content analytics, who just wants to know what's inside that content specifically without any audience analysis around it. That's a possibility. Um, we have customers that want to look at, at 
audience analytics very deeply. Um, so they, under, you know, we can segment and help them understand how to promote and more of this and they like this content and et cetera. And that's separate. When you bring those two elements together, we can give you resonance. We can tell you what works. So those are the, 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 the stool really. And you're focusing on content, not on advertising. We are working with some brands now who have okay. content who would like to wow. see some analysis of their commercials. And that's um, something that didn't occur to us initially, but we know is really, it's very valuable. It, there, you know, it, it's, you think that because somebody's spending $2 billion that they have all the insight they need, which is literally what I thought. And in fairness, it's just too much data. And so what we can do is tell you which creative in which marketplace down to the store, down to the store level, this creative with this offer is what gave you lift. So clearly for performance for that, the KPI is going to be a business metric, whether it's revenue increases or uh, store traffic or whatever's a proxy for you, this ad that we ran made this successful in this way. So that, that's really how we're, we're doing the analysis. But to be able to know, we did have somebody say to us, and this is what started the whole thing, within my creative, is the celebrity I'm hiring actually moving the needle enough? Or is this other character that we developed the one that's moving the needle? And when you have many off, multiple offers because you're hitting multiple audience targets and your buy is across the US plus spot buy on top of it, and you want to know this by, by, by city at a minimum and then by store, most companies don't have that kind of deep analytics inside, and we do. So we're able to come back and say, this is the buy rate against the business lift. So this is, this is a brand new endeavor for us. Okay, good luck. Um, does that mean you're, um, are you integrating with third-party attribution oriented companies or are you doing anything with that? You connecting with those kinds of? We have not been asked to do that yet. Um, I, I wouldn't say no to that. Of course, that would you know take a little bit longer. We would have to analyze the data and be able to bring it in. But mm -hmm. if a customer has their own social data and wants to apply it, yes, we will bring that into, into the analysis for certain. Okay, so now um, that gives uh, everybody, uh, all of our viewers, a good understanding, I think, of what you're doing and what's coming up, right? Um, so we want to talk a little bit about the industry at large and why, you know, why people are or are not uh, embracing this kind of technology or why they should embrace this technology. I mean, the OTT marketplace uh, is a rich tapestry of opportunity right now where they could really measure some interesting things. Do you think they're, uh, um, you know, moving quickly in this area or not quickly enough? Well, I would have to say I wish they were moving more quickly. Um, but then again, I would always say that. Um, yes, there is a, a rich opportunity for us to help them understand who their viewers are, who the, the, the you know, A plus content users are and help them segment that and then find content that appeals more directly. So there's a lot of opportunity to help boost subscribers with looking at the, the audience data very deeply and then, and then tying that to the content. I think that that is less about know what works and more about audience and deep audience analytics because the content they have licensed is the content they have. But when we start to parse that into multiple genres, so for instance, I understand Netflix has, I don't know, like 92,000 different ways they describe a genre where most of us have, you know, comedy, dramedy, you know, drama. I mean, we don't, we don't have the segmentation done to that level. But when you have a platform such as ours, then you can begin to cross those over and, and be able to start to understand more deeply what, because I'm a more complex person than I just happen to like dramas, right? But if you're looking at just what I down or what I viewed, what I streamed last week, you you know you may not think that. But if you can understand how complex I am over time, which is what AI will allow you to do, then you start to super serve me, and that is the opportunity. You know, there's a lot of competition in the on-demand, the download, the streaming world right now. There have been a lot of new entrants, most re recently HBO Max, and every one of those has a different 
um, like content library that will re respond to different people at different times. So I don't have the Disney one, for instance, because we don't have kids. But, you know, I pretty much have everything else um, at this point. Who knows? I probably will get it. But at the end of the day, how are you going to be the streamer that they keep? You know, am I going to keep Peacock? Am I going to, how are you going to do that? Using a great deal of AI and data, which is available to you, you will have a better chance of doing that. Your marketing will improve. Your messages will improve. Your, your, the way you're serving content up to your users will or your viewers will improve. And that was not possible a few years ago, but it is now. And when we think about some of the very successful ones out there, like Netflix, for instance, and, and Amazon Prime, they have data in their DNA. They're using it to great effect. And I will say that Amazon has a little bit of a different outcome. I mean, they're trying to super serve their Prime members, and they're doing a brilliant job of that. But they use data to make sure they are doing a brilliant job of that. Is that, I mean, I know you're working with TiVo. I mean, but can you work with these companies on a platform basis like that? Or maybe they're creating this kind of, um, uh, ex, you know, uh, analysis in-house. Or is that something you could offer? Uh, they, I would say that they do, those probably have some very good audience analysis, whether or not they have great video or content analysis um, is up for debate. I would say that, you know, we have, we have had customers compare our output to a lot of others out there like Google and IBM and AWS. And our output is, is very usable right away because it's very specific to the industry. It's not that those aren't good platforms. They are. But what, when you run your video through it, it, it really identifies mostly objects. And that's the limitation because it is there to super serve the country. It's not just for media. Ours is for media. And that's why it's so important that we include audio in our analysis, because that's how we get the context. And what we do is we look for the changes in the video that determine whether it is a, it, you know, it's a new shot for real, and how much motion is in that shot and whether or not it has changed. There's a lot of technology that we've built that is hugely proprietary, and that's what allows our output to be so spot on for media. And again, our code books, when I go back to that, you know, we have trained millions of hours and we've trained that video so that our AI so that it, on video so that it understands what it is seeing that goes back to that human like approach that's what mm -hmm. we mean because you don't care when you watch the news that there happened to be a red car in the background or that there's a house with a white picket fence not if the story is about a lost child that so that's I have an ice cream on priorities right. interesting right uh, can you talk about your customers? Can you name? We um, really don't name our customers, and Can I wish I could do time. that. If you had told me, you were going to ask me that question, I would have asked a few of them in advance to see oh. if we could. Mm -hmm. um, well, everybody yeah. should always assume I'm going to ask you about who your customers are. <laughs> Who's watching these videos? Okay. We are, we are under NDA. There, there are some very, very important reasons for that. All of the content that people own is, is proprietary to them and an extremely valuable asset. And I think that in part that is the case. I think that once AI is, is more, even more accepted, I think it will be um, easier for companies to start talking about how they're using us and what they're using us for publicly. Right now, I think it's a little bit of a, on the quiet um, or like a secret weapon. Yes. Secret yeah. weapon. It is a secret uh, weapon. Why, why, um, why wouldn't companies want to embrace this? It just seems like if you've got billions of dollars to spend, this would be something, you know, that you would spend it on. You'd want to know that kind of deep analysis. What's preventing them? What are the challenges? Is it just the, your price? Uh, maybe that's too Definitely, much. It's not price. Like what is it? What, what's the bar what are the barriers or the challenges for a company? And what are the pluses? I think one of the barriers, whatever the pluses. What are the barriers? Sorry. The, the barriers are really that that it's it's new, right? It's it's something brand new. It it may sound scary when you don't know what it is and how it's applied. We've had people say, Oh, you're gonna come in and just start writing the news, you know, with a computer. No, no, we're not. I don't believe in any way, shape, or form anything is better than human creativity. What we're trying to do is take some of the guess out of it. 
And I'll give you an example. We had a customer who asked us to answer a series of questions about a, the first year of a series, right? It had already run, was on the air, and they were about to open the writer's room up for season two. And they felt like our platform would really help them get some baseline understanding of what to keep and what to ditch. You know, saying that kind of roughly. And they had some questions. And I can share two of those questions with you. They specifically wanted to know if the location mattered. And they also wanted to know if the name mattered. And then they said, it, you know, it doesn't matter what you come back and tell us because we've already made the decision to change the name. And we ran the analysis through the platform and showed them the data. And it was clear, don't change the name and they changed it back. They reversed themselves. Because so much of what we do is what we think. And we're in media. And we're all pretty smart. I mean, you know, those people who are making these decisions are really smart people. And it's based on what we think from years and years of being inside the media industry and seeing what works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. but, but now you're able to answer some of those basic things. And then decide, okay, well, you know what? Great. The location doesn't matter. Terrific. And we'll move the location or whatever they decided to do. It's not taking away the creativity. It's not taking away the strategy and decision making, but it is giving you one more tool in your toolbox that will help you tip your outcome to have a greater audience, which means greater revenue. Uh, I have one word for you, which is politics. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I know you said you're doing some brands, but is that an area you think that would be uh, a perfect target for this type of technology or? Possibly. We have not explored that, um, admittedly. Um, but I can see an application where we are looking at the creative and tying it to outcomes such as, you know, new volunteers or donations you know, I, I could see that as possible, yes. And we would be able to test that video pretty quickly through the platform, right? This is resonating. Yeah, I mean, I, it would be interesting. I mean, to be honest, I would really love, and I, you, I know you can't do it, but I would really love, and I think it would be interesting to people, um, like a little bit of data, like, you know, the, to show people what's going on, what is resonating, just a couple of data points put out there in the media. I'm just making that recommendation. All right, we will take you on. We'll see okay. we can, what we can do, although it's really kind of tight oh, between yes. now and election day. It sort of wet everyone's whistle uh, for this. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, metrics. How are you able to uh, measure what you're doing uh, to the, the metrics industry? Because what everybody's providing are in silos still, right? How are yeah. you able to sort of sync and show people that what you're, what you're able to find out uh, perhaps is um, uh, consistent across platform. Are you analyzing content that goes across all platforms? And how do you, or can you measure that against the databases they bring in those siloed um, platform environments? That's sort of a complicated question. Yeah, but the, the short answer is yes, we can do that. And so we, we have done that. We have brought together linear viewing we, to create a total viewing. Do you mean cross-platform total viewing? Yes, we have done that for a customer who had a couple of different ways that, they're, that you could get their content. One of the big important measures is the content is the same. If the content is changed, edited, mm -hmm. or different on a different platform, that's going to be more difficult. And it would be a separate analysis. We wouldn't be able to bring it together per se. So, you know, if you extract a news story from a newscast and you put that entire story on your digital platform, then yes, we can measure that performance. And yes, the data is siloed, but it's not siloed once it gets to us. And that's our first step, yes. right? Is to and bring and that all together. It would be also interesting to see how um, the platform itself uh, adds into the mix and how it influences people's response to the content itself. Are you measuring that kind of thing? We are not measuring that outcome because we are looking at specifically how do we help our customer and that's the content creator. Okay. So we're not looking at the other side of it. Uh, we are very interested in whether or not they apply 
the learnings that they get from the platform. And, you know, generally, yes, they do. There are going to be times when they cannot. And for instance, um, we were asked about, uh, there was a show that was using many locations and it was very, very expensive. And they wanted to know what of these locations can we, you know, pull from the story and it won't be harmful. Well, if you've got a contract already in place for those locations for the next season, you're not going to be able to react to it, right? So there are going to be constraints that, that are there that are not in our purview, that, that we are not able to ascertain because it's not our data. But we will come back and give you the, the, the whole story. And then, and then as an executive, you make the decision about whether or not you want to do that in, in the subsequent season or even in the same season. So if it's early in the season and let's say it's a reality show, then we're able to offer analysis before the next week so that you can understand what's resonating with the audience. Do I feature this person or that person or this storyline or this thread going through here? So there's always ways to be very helpful and influential. However, if the person was resonating but got kicked off on the show last week, we can't fix that, right? right. So, you know, so there are some limitations. It's interesting because um, you can do that. You can do the response, the results so quickly. Um, it's yes. uh, in some ways they kind of need it like weeks ahead, but yet. Okay. Anyway, so was there any particular um, result that came back that really shocked you? That that something that uh, you just weren't expecting? Something that really stands out? Um, well, that's a tough one because one of the ones that did shock me at one point, and I have to be super careful here, was a particular actor that I liked, but the audience loathed. And so, you know, my opinion of that was upended. I thought it was a good job and a good, and the audience in general had a massive dislike. So I was surprised by that. Interesting. Okay. Um, anything else coming up uh, for you or uh, are, what are the challenges ahead? What are the things that you can't do now that you, you want to do later? What, you know, what are the challenges for the AI industry? Well, there's a great deal on, the, on our roadmap. And um, I, I will tell you that most of that is deeply proprietary because this is a very, very competitive area. Yes. But we continue to develop the AI in more and more specifics around themes and just those really high level concepts. And one of the things that we look at all the time is faster, faster, cheaper, cheaper. And that is our, I would say overarchingly, is our biggest challenge and where our emphasis in our roadmap is faster, faster, cheaper, cheaper, and more, more. That's right? like a movie title. <laughs> Volume. And so for us, it's really, you know, we're a small team and we want to scale. So that's really where, where our, our thinking is. Are you hiring? We are hiring. Okay, everybody, make sure you contact Randa and go to their website at resonanceai.com. Um, I was looking at resonance.ai. Do you own that? No. No. Okay. ResonanceAI.com, and I think that's it for now, Randa. I really appreciate your participating. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, thank you, Tracy. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the company. You know, there's nothing I like better. So thank you. All right, very cool. Uh, Randa is the co-founder and COO of Resonance AI, and um, she's been in industry a long time. She's a veteran, and uh, but she's on the cutting edge of this technology, which is still pushing the medium, the industry of TV forward. So uh, definitely give her uh, a call. Contact her. Thank you. And I'm Tracy Swedlow. This is Television Nation. Please contact me if you want to be on the show or you've got some questions or you want to be involved in our conference coming up September 9th and 10th called the TV Team Leadership Congress. And make sure you nominate your peers for our awards for leadership. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Randa. Bye-bye.